Good evening. I'd like to begin with a simple statement. Horse racing kills horses. Again, horse racing kills horses. This is not hyperbole, no mere conjecture. It's a fact. Not just a few here and there. Multiple horses die on U.S. tracks every day. But before I get into the specifics or the other wrongs that define this vile industry, a little about how this horse racing wrongs came to be. A few years back, while writing the animal rights blog on the Times Union website, I was doing some research for a prospective post on horse racing. At the time, I was aware of the slaughter issue, as some prominent outlets, including HBO's Real Sports, had covered it. But I soon discovered that no one, no individual, no organization, not PETA, not the HSUS, was taking on this industry full bore, documenting the everyday cruelty and killing. So I decided to step into that void. I did, not because I have any racing background, I don't, nor because I have a special affinity for equines, I care for all animals equally. Rather, I saw a desperate need, exploited animals who were being sorely underrepresented and set out to try to help. When I launched the website in 2012, I envisioned a clearinghouse of sorts for all things negative I could find on in the industry. The drugging, the doping, whipping, slaughter, of course. But a few months in, I began reviewing the official race charts each morning. These charts covering every thoroughbred and quarter horse race run in America are a basic recounting of how the race is unfolded, box scores, if you will, for the betters. But amid the handicapping data, conditions, odds, payouts, and performance numbers, places, lengths back, times, are notes for each of the horses. And within these notes can be found some of the bad. I quickly learned what went wrong, took a bad step, came back lame, returned bleeding from the nostrils, pulled up in distress, fell, did not finish, and vanned off meant. And it wasn't long at all before I understood broke down as the industry's euphemism of choice for dead. So from these charts, I began compiling and publishing weekly lists. Still, I wanted more, more information, more data, more facts to fight this multi-billion dollar industry. And after talking to the Grey 2K people, an organization committed to and on the precipice of achieving the end of Greyhound racing in America, I began filing Freedom of Information Act requests with each racing state. The result was the first of its kind killed in action list. Confirmed deaths on American tracks, names, dates, locations. That initial list in 2014 was roughly 1,000 strong, a number that has remained remarkably consistent in each year since. But after factoring in what I don't or can't have, states that deny my request outright on the dubious basis of confidentiality, other states that withhold training deaths, the so-called catastrophically injured who are euthanized back at the owner's farm after being acquired by a rescue, horses who perish at private training facilities, an apathetic or and or slipshod reporting to and from racing commissions. I have come to conclude that upward of 2,000 horses are killed racing or training on American tracks every year. Over 2,000. Imagine that. How, you may ask, do they die? Well, death, as it turns out, comes in various forms. Imploded hearts, sudden cardiac events, they call them. This, mind you, to animals who are mostly still in puberty. Pulmonary hemorrhage, or bleeding to death. Head trauma from collisions with other horses or the track itself. Broken necks, crushed spines, and shattered legs sometimes shattered so severely that the limb remains attached to the rest of the body by skin or tendons only. Often, transport is impossible, so the horse must wait in pain and terror for the vet to arrive with the pink solution that will end his life. Other times, the mortally injured animal is vanned back to the barn where it can be in industry parlance humanely destroyed, far from the public eye obviously exactly the way the industry prefers. To more personalize this killing, I'd like to share with you some of the information I received from state racing commissions for 2017. 
The descriptions and circumstances of these deaths come directly from the FOIA documents. While listening, however, please remember that the 30 or so horses I'm about to name are but a tiny sampling of the over 4,000 I have documented on the website. Famous attitude, killed in Texas, horse collapsed and died on track post wire, horse reportedly had frothy hemorrhagic bilateral nasal discharge. Call me an illusion, killed in Louisiana, ran into rail, rail went into plural or lung space. Johanna Joe killed in Ohio, broke down around half mile pole, then continued to run half mile. Repeated trauma caused ankle to become dislocated and destroyed soft tissues. Ran to finish line where she was put down on track. Max Posse killed in New York, fell. Several attempts to stand, unsuccessful, severe traumatic back pelvic injury. You know, you know, profuse hemorrhage from both nostrils. Parks Wave Dancer, killed in Texas, horse collapsed, spinal cord fracture. <coughs> Baytown Princess, killed in Ohio, compound open, which means the skin was broken. Complete transverse fracture of both front cannon bones just below the knees. Sendero 6, killed in Texas, horse began to buck before finish line. Hit and flipped over inside rail, stood and attempted to jump back over, but fell backwards, landing hard. Attempted to jump rail again, but collapsed and became recumbent and went into shock. Coolant killed in New Jersey. Euthanasia due to shock from large laceration with arterial bleeding. Saints Be Praised killed in Delaware, suffered fractures to both front legs at the half mile pole. Zulu Echo killed in Ohio, multiple fractures of the pastern, unable to bear weight. The left hock was also lacerated and the joint was exposed, most likely caused by right rear leg when horse was scrambling to recover. Retrade killed in Pennsylvania, broke both front legs. The chart, by the way, for this one merely said that the horse collapsed. Yes, he collapsed from two broken legs. Ruth's Lotus killed an Ohio horse fractured both knees at three-eighths pole. Then there is the 2016 Pennsylvania report to date the most detailed documentation I have received. It should be noted that in addition to providing an immediate cause of death, virtually every necropsy indicated the presence of ulcers in the dead horse, most extensive to severe. Stand by your man killed at Penn National. One third of left scalpula shattered into multiple displaced pieces. Severe damage of the surrounding skeletal muscle and soft tissue, including a severed blood vessel and severe hemorrhage. Gold teeth killed at Parks. This horse was involved in a three horse collision. Broken back. Death due to vertebral fracture and exsanguination. Exsanguination means that she hemorrhaged or bled out to death. Diggers Jigger. This horse was involved in a three-horse collision, the same one. Found dead in her stall next morning. Death due to axiomusculoskeletal trauma and exsanguination. Dancing terror killed at the meadows, a harness track. Left hind limb was swollen with a puncture wound through which the bone was protruding. Eight large pieces of bone and numerous small pieces present. Joe Boo Kelly prior to a race at Penn National. Horse became unstable during the post parade and then fell and died. The ulceration of the stomach was severe, 90 to 100 erosions and ulcers. Joe Boo Kelly was four years old. Great White Buffalo killed the Presque Isle, both front fetlocks attached by skin only, leaving the distal cannon bones exposed, covered with ground in dirt and severe bruising, gastric ulcers quite extensive. Is you talking to me five days later at that same track, left front fetlock attached by skin only leaving the distal cannon bones exposed, covered with ground and dirt and severe bruising, again, gastric ulcers extensive. Colonel Slanders at Penn, sesamoid fractured into three fragments, ligaments shredded. Score lines and bruising in front fetlocks are suggestive of repetitive osseous stress syndrome a common finding in fetlocks of racing thoroughbreds. 
four years old, less than two years of racing. Age of fluffy prior to a race at Presque Isle, spine fractured. Gastric ulcers are common in horses on NSAIDs, which are anti-inflammatory drugs, and in training. These were extensive and may have caused the horse to be painful from them during the paddock period. This may have led to the horse rearing and flipping over backwards. Died from ulcers. Bobby McDuffie at Penn, complete rupture of the distal sesamoidian ligaments with hemorrhage. The spleen is enlarged and filled with blood. Gambler 5 at Penn, deep digital flexor tendon completely severed and displaced. Dorsal surface of the superficial digital flexor tendon shredded. Multiple ligaments torn. Medial proximal sesamoid bone has a complete mid-body fracture. Lateral proximal sesamoid bone fractured into multiple pieces. That's one horse, one death. South Philly Magic at Parks horse had a broken neck and was dead when the veterinarian arrived. Star cover at Pocono, again another harness track. Upon exam, it was both visually and palpably obvious that there was a complete breakdown injury to the suspensory apparatus. Both sesamoids were fractured and the ankle was on the ground when attempting to bear weight. Queen Patron at Penn, compound fracture of fetlock, Protrusion of metacarpal and sesamoid bones through the laceration. Exposed bones are covered in dirt and debris. The mucosa of the stomach contains 53 erosions and ulcers. Sarah Ancha at Penn, compound comminuted, which means pulverized into many pieces, fracture of the left forelimb, severe soft tissue damage with exposure of several fragments of bone. And finally, Katina butterfly at Parks. The horse was down, depressed, had labored breathing and a very swollen face with a bad odor and some nasal discharge. Died before a tracheotomy could be performed. Necropsy revealed severe extensive cellulitis, severe gastric ulcers, renal papillary necrosis, and severe traumatic osteoarthropathy. Katina Butterfly was three years old. That number 2,000, staggering though it is, tells but a part of the story. Each year, countless others, perhaps just as many as those killed on the track, die from what the industry conveniently files under non-racing causes. Things like colic, a painful, terrifying abdominal condition. Infection, barn accident, the proverbial complications after surgery are simply found dead and stalled. In truth, though, the where and how matters not a whit. In truth, every dead horse is a racing with a capital R casualty. And even worse, all of them, whether killed on the track or off, were victims prior to dying. All of them were made to suffer the standard life of a racehorse. That is, a life of pathetic solitude and isolation. All the more cruel when we consider the social herd nature of horses. A life of miserable, monotonous confinement. And except for race day or perhaps a brief training period in the morning, a life of spirit-crushing immobilization. A pitiful stillness that makes a mockery of the industry claim that horses are born to run, love to run. A life of needles and syringes and injury-numbing chemicals. A life of absolute control and utter subjugation, of lip tattoos, nose chains, metal bits, and leather whips. A life of anxiety and stress, shuffled from trainer to trainer, barn to barn, track to track, state to state. A life as a thing, a piece of property to be bought, sold, traded, and dumped whenever and however an owner decides. In short, a life of negation. In reality, no life at all. Then to slaughter. While the industry desperately tries to downplay the extent of the problem, cunningly flashing its zero tolerance policies and aftercare programs in defense. We do have statistics from which to draw conclusions. 
According to the Equine Welfare Alliance, using USDA data, in the nine-year period 2008 to 2016, over 1.2 million American horses were sent to slaughter. As an aside, the last equine slaughterhouses on U.S. soil closed in 2007. Now we simply ship them, itself a horror, to Canada and Mexico. That 1.2 million translates to over 134,000 every year. <coughs> A Wild for Life Foundation study, the only of its kind, and again using USDA data, found that from 2002 to 2010, fully 19% of the Americans slaughtered were thoroughbreds. Even if we were to use a far lower percentage, say 12%, we're still left with over 15,000 thoroughbred racehorses butchered annually. For comparison purposes, the Jockey Club's official registry for new thoroughbreds, or in a telling bit of language, full crop, numbers roughly 21,000 in each of the past six years. In other words, that's 20,000 or so coming in, 15,000 or more going out via slaughter. In other words, slaughter has been and remains this industry's primary method for disposing spent racehorses. And that's just thoroughbreds, mind you. How many more erstwhile standard bred and quarter horse athletes meet the same brutal end? And what is that brutal end? Sold at auction to kill buyers, transported to holding pens, and ultimately shipped hundreds, if not thousands of miles in cramped trailers, where the USDA has determined they can go 28 to 36 hours without food, water, or rest. Their final destination is a cold, concrete abattoir. Here, amid the terrifying sights, sounds, and smells of death, they will be shot. Often this takes multiple rounds as the panicked, flight-inclined equines make difficult targets. Shackled by their hind legs, hoisted and hung upside down, slashed, bled out occasionally while still conscious, and carved up for meat. The whimsical names and cheering crowds a bitter lifetime ago. Of this final perfidy, Twyla Francois, Canadian horse slaughter expert, said it best, and I quote, They are so frightened. You can see them in the auction ring, that they search the ring looking for a friendly face. We see this at the slaughterhouses, too, where they're still seeking out affection from even the slaughterhouse workers themselves. And one thing we saw that really broke my heart was you would see the walk workers walking by the pens, and the horses would rush the pens, looking for comfort from these men who were going to kill them. It just seems like such a betrayal. Nothing can prepare them for the journey they have ahead of them after they've been given up. <clears throat> All this, the snapped cannon bones and ruptured suspensory ligaments of race day, the collapsed and died in morning practice, the colic laminitis found dead in stalls, and the exsanguinations leads to a single, inescapable conclusion. The American horse racing industry is engaged in wholesale carnage. Again, not hyperbole, carnage. Armed with the proceeding, you might think this would be an easy sell to mainstream America. After all, sensibilities are changing. Ringland Brothers is dead. It will soon be illegal to use elephants for entertainment in New York State. SeaWorld, owing mostly to the movie Blackfish, has ended its captive breeding program, and it's but a matter of time before the orca shows disappear entirely, and with that, perhaps SeaWorld itself. And as mentioned, dog racing is not long for this country. So what gives with horse racing? Why is it that the HSUS, one of the largest and most famous animal advocacy organizations in the world, stands against all animal entertainment, the bullfight, the rodeo, the circus, film, television, commercials, and yes, greyhound racing, all except horse racing. For me, the answer is twofold. One, we are a relatively young organization, and while we have made great strides educating and exposing, much ground remains. The second and far more significant factor, however, can be found right there in racing's well-known epithet, the sport of kings. Yes, horse racing is sport, a notion so deeply ingrained in our national consciousness that we hardly give it a second thought. Racing results are published in the sports pages. 
Bob Costas and NBC Sports cover the Triple Crown, Breeders' Cup, and other big races. Horse racing was featured on the cover of Sports Illustrated 46 times in that iconic magazine's first 30 years. ESPN, the sports network named Secretariat the 35th greatest athlete of the 20th century, with Man of War citation and two jockeys also cracking the top 100. And then there are the movies. Dripping with irresistible sentimentality, Hollywood has, practically from its beginning, unabashedly cranked out celluloid sports classics featuring racehorses. National Velvet, The Black Stallion, Sea Biscuit, the kids' movie Racing Stripes, Ruffian, Disney's Secretariat, to name a few. Speaking from personal experience, I was a big sports fan growing up in the 70s and 80s. And while I had a favorite in every category, while I didn't follow racing year round, I do remember tuning in around Triple Crown time, rooting on the likes of Seattle Slough and Affirmed. It seemed, in a word, natural. Indeed, we need look no further than our own area where hallowed Saratoga Racecourse proudly builds itself the oldest sporting venue in the nation, dating all the way back to the Civil War. If racing is bad, most people think it's bad like boxing or baseball during the steroid era. Dirty, perhaps corrupt, but nothing a good house cleaning couldn't fix. In the end, it's all really just a matter of simple conditioning. If you say something long and often enough, people begin to accept it as fact. They have been telling us that horse racing is a sport for centuries. Well, to all that, I reply, if horse racing is a sport, then that word must be redefined, for the competitive racing of horses resembles no other accepted sport on the planet. And what other sport are the bodies of adolescent athletes pounded into the ground without remorse? And what other sport are the athletes kept tightly <coughs> confined in tiny spaces alone for over 23 hours a day? In what other sport are the athletes condemned to a life as literal chattel? In what other sport are the athletes drugged and doped without consent? In what other sport are the athletes whipped, beaten for motivation? In what other sport are the athletes routinely dying on the playing field? and after having the rest of the day's festivities continue. And in what other sport are most of the athletes brutally and violently destroyed once their careers have come to an end? Horse racing is sport, not for the gravity involved, it would be absurd. No, horse racing is but exploitation of a weaker species for among the most shameful of reasons, $2 bets. To those who sustain this sordid business, we say, Slake those gambling urges with decidedly inanimate slots and scratch-offs. Leave the horses out of it. To those who trade in equines in the pursuit of cash and fleeting glory, we say, find a commodity that doesn't bleed. Take up a hobby that can't cry out in pain. Enough. Thank you. Yeah.